on this week's What to Ship, ocean carriers are in panic mode. Chaos theory spreads across the tanker sector. We've got a drone strike on a tanker. We've got a tug strike in Australia. And we have sexual harassment at sea and at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. All of that on what's going on with shipping. I'm your host, Almer Cogliano. That's a lot to get to. We're going to cover all five of those stories today and recap major events that have happened this week in ocean shipping. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a second, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into this. All right, we're continually sorting out in story number one what is going on with ocean shipping regarding containers because you can read two different stories here at the same time and one side will tell you it's the end of the world and the other side's telling you that it's great. So what is going on here? And this, I hope, will explain why you're seeing maybe a couple of different narratives on this same story. So this one from Lodestar on G Captain carriers in panic mode as China bookings plummet. Now, what we're seeing and very clear here is that the amount of cargo coming out of Asia is decreasing for a couple of reasons. We know imports are down in the China. And remember, China doesn't manufacture as much as they assemble. So you got to bring a lot of imports in for them to develop everything. So if China is decreasing the amount of load coming into them, we know about 60 to 90 days down the chain, we see that manifest itself. And that's showing up here in these numbers. You have this report from Mike Schuller over at G Captain. October imports at Port of LA plunged to lowest level since 2009. This is up and down the West Coast. We're seeing this. But again, it deals with a series of issues that we're seeing. A lot of this has to do with LA and Long Beach not attracting cargo as much and cargo shifting over to the East Coast. I know you've heard me say this multiple times. This story right here, also from Mike Schiller, holiday retail sales off to a strong start in the U.S. All right, hang on, Sal. How can you be off to a strong start in retail sales if imports are down? Well, again, go back to last year when we had 109 ships sitting off L.A. and Long Beach. A lot of the cargo that was intended for the holiday season never landed. Or if it did land, it landed after the holiday season. So a lot of stuff has been piled up in warehouses waiting to get out. In other words, Target, Ikea, Home Depot, all the big box stores have excess inventory and they're clearing their inventory out into the stores right now. And this is where you're seeing that buying power coming from. They don't have to order as much what you would typically see on top of normal sales. And, and this is where you start hearing this weird, ooh, hitting my mic, going crazy here. This is where you start hearing this across the news spectrum. What you usually see at this time of the year is on top of the normal shipping, that added padded layer for holiday sales. And that's what we're not seeing right now. We're not seeing that huge padded layer on top. And that's making everyone sit there and say, this is a down year. But again, go back to my videos that we've talked about this. This is a record year. We have busted the amount of imports for this year already. Everything on top of this is just, you know, again, it's icing on the cake. Go over this story right here from Greg M uh, Miller. Los Angeles import keeps sinking as East Coast ports gain more ground. This goes back to that issue we just saw with the Mike Schuller story where we're seeing them falling. But again, if you look at this, and, and Greg's doing it right here, you're looking at it compared to year on year. You're looking at last year. Last year was red letter year. It was huge. It was a massive year. The year before that was a red letter year. Well, how's this compared to 2019? Well, we're a little bit above 2019, as a matter of fact. When you start looking at that and what you're seeing is a lot of those imports aren't showing up in L.A. and Long Beach, but they are showing up on the east and west coast. This story here by Mike Schuller, U.S. container imports fall. Port of Savannah reports second busiest month in October. So Savannah, Houston, New York, New Jersey, smaller ports, Baltimore, Norfolk, Charleston, Jacksonville, uh, Boston, Mobile, we're seeing these ports handling this excess right now. And remember, more than 50% of the containers looked at John McCallum's most recent October report. About 52% of containers are coming into the west, uh, the East Coast and Gulf Coast, vice the West Coast. And we're also seeing a backlash against the ocean carriers. This story, which kind of flew under the radar, a really important one from Lodestar, shippers file FMC, this is the Federal Maritime Commission complaint, because Maersk is, quote, flouts the law to rake in profits. 
So there's going to be, there is, not going to be, there is a pushback against the big ocean carriers right now for some of their ocean rates. Remember, one of the things that happened during the period of peak shipping is a lot of ocean carriers locked in rates with their usual com customers over a long time so that now some of these customers are paying higher rates than they could get on the spot market. Now, they're adjusting because they're worried about canceling contracts and, and falling out. And let me be clear, shipping contracts are wor worthless, basically. You can cancel them with very little penalty because there's almost no enforcement measure for it. But the power of the alliances are the big key because if you tick off Maersk, then they could block you from using MSC in their alliance, and that restricts your ability to get the ability, uh, restricts your ability to ship cargo, which could become a liability for you. So what we're seeing right now is ocean containers are coming down, definitely. We're, we're definitely seeing the volume coming down. We're seeing the rates come down, but the rates are coming down much faster on the Pacific than they are in the Atlantic and European runs. But the big question is going to be come the end of the first quarter of 23, how do things spring back? What are we going to see? Are, we're not going to see 22 and 21 years. We're not going to see that volume. But do we come back to 2019 and the normal growth pattern associated with shipping? Or do we hit a recession and we go down the path of 2008 and everything collapses, which is what nobody wants? So big questions to see what's happening. All right, let's head over to the tanker sector for story number two. Story number two, Greg Miller over at FreightWaves. Chaos Theory, how tankers thrive amid energy crisis and war. So Greg does one of his in-depth here looking at what's going on in the tanker sector. And I got to say his, his subtitle here is the key thing. The party hasn't even started yet. Because the tanker sector is is waiting for the takeoff. What containers were two years ago, tankers are probably looming to become in this next coming year because of what's going on with energy demands and boycotts and the price cap going to Russian oil. All this is happening. And what you're seeing here, as Greg mentions, is the worst energy crisis since 1979-1980 with the fight for LNG all set to heat up and the scramble for diesel. I mean, Greg, right there in those four kind of subtitles really synopsizes the issue here for you. And what we're seeing in these supplement stories all build on this. This story from Bloomberg, a G-Captain, America's unfished LNG export projects race to meet demand for fuel-starved Europe. All right, go back to the nomination or the confirmation ceremony for the most recent maritime administration uh, administrator, Admiral Ann Phillips. And one of the things that Ted Cruz, and I have a video on this that talks about this, asked about were four permits for LNG facilities, three in Texas, one in Louisiana, to be completed so that they can open these LNG facilities, loading facilities, so that they can export out LNG because of the demand going on. It's supposed to take a year to get these things cleared. They were taking over that. And supposedly... That was going to be a priority for Admiral Phillips. And what we're seeing here is that these some of these projects are coming to fruition. This is the EIA report. Again, go, always go back to my buddies at EIA. I should get something from EIA. Can I be clear? I plug them all the time. But anyway, uh, here you have the natural gas weekly update. This slide I thought was really good because it shows you the export capacity by projects. And you can see how starting in 2016 with Sabine Pass and moving all the way up here, you have the adding of capacity so that we can be exporting LNG, which is key. It's absolutely key. We were producing LNG prior to 2016. We just couldn't export it because remember, you have to take the natural gas, liquefy it, and have the facilities to pump it to ships. And that's what we're seeing right now. Remember earlier, we had the Freeport explosion that, des that destroyed part of the facility at Freeport, one of the largest facilities in the United States. Well, this story from Bloomberg on G-Captain, Freeport LNG may extend Texas plant outage through December. They're trying to get everything up so that they can get it back up to fuel full capacity. And remember, this is all taking place in the backdrop of what is going on in Russia. And this Bloomberg story, Russian fuel exports by sea surge ahead of U U EU sanctions. The EU and the G7 are getting ready to initiate a price cap starting December 5th. And we had the story, I talked about it on the last video when I was talking about the Black Sea Grain Initiative, how Turkey just passed a resolution that 
only ships with insurance will be able to sail through the Turkish Straits. So if Turk, if the Russians decide to ship oil above the price cap and they don't have insurance for it, then they're not going to be able to transit the Turkish Straits on the way out. That leads to this story here from also from Bloomberg. Russia faces oil shut in or price cap amid sanctions. Next week, that's going to be the story coming up here is how the G7 EU price cap comes into effect and the ability to enforce that. They want everything from this deal. They want to keep the flow of Russian oil going because they can't stop it because they, they, there's not enough oil to, to, to replace it. And at the same time, they want to hurt Russia economically by lowering the price. And understand, that's going to hurt everybody. Russian oil is already cheap, and it's flooding the market in lots of places. And if you keep driving down the price of Russian oil, whether you do it naturally because Putin needs to sell it to maintain his war program, or you artificially do it with a price cap, you're going to drive down the price of oil everywhere, including American oil that we're exporting in largest numbers ever. And if you drive down our costs, that's just going to impact inflation even more, which seems to be, I, I don't know why they don't understand this. I really don't. And I think this is a terrible idea. I just can't say this enough. This is a terrible idea, this price cap, because you cannot get a little bit of a blockade. You either blockade or you don't. And what they're trying to do is a little bit of both. And man, it's just going to come back and bite us in the ass. I just, I just feel that way about this program because everyone I've talked to, I've talked to really smart people about this, much smarter than me. Let's be clear about this because I'm an idiot at times. I've talked to smart people about this and even they are like, I don't understand this. It's, it's, I don't know how we're going to make this work. And if they're telling me that, it gets me nervous. I'm not going to lie. It gets me nervous when I hear that from them. All right. Well, that's, that's a depressing story. Let's go to a less depressing story. Iranian drones attacking tankers. So at uh, the conference I was just at, the Maritime Security uh, Challenges Conference up in Victoria, I was asked a question about piracy or what was the biggest threat facing shipping today? And, you know, I, I talked about it being COVID initially and it was like, OK, what's the big looming issue facing shipping today? And I talked about the fact that it's cyber attacks and uh, this type of electronic piracy. And I got asked about, you know, well, what about these drone attacks on ships? And these drone attacks right now are not a major issue, I have to say. I, I don't mean to belittle them because I have the hugest sympathy for the crews on board vessels that can be killed by these stupid things. But in terms of interdicting and stopping the flow, these, these are gnats on the back of a dinosaur. These really are. You have this story right here from Reuters. British say drone circles ship in the Gulf of Oman. This is after the drone attack that took place on board the Pacific Zion, uh, which damaged the vessel, but did not stop it. And what we're seeing here is very similar to the attacks we saw last year, where the Iranians were using drones to attack a variety of vessels, at least four vessels were hit with both surface drones and then mines put on the side of vessels by crews. And this is part of an Iranian harassment operation that we've seen been going on for years now. And the these drones these th that they're using are probably the same ones that the Russians are using in Ukraine right now. We're, we're already hearing reports that they're selling them in large numbers to the Russians. And it, it seems like they're testing them or using them. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason in some of these attacks. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. This is the uh, an image of one of those style of drones that was used to attack being launched off their uh, expeditionary support base, their, their kind of floating tanker base. Uh, this is the damage it did. Uh, again, you know, the drone can puncture through the hull. This is actually in the house, in the after superstructure of the vessel. And this is the remnants of it here. Uh, it packs an explosive warhead, not huge. And understand, uh, a loaded oil tanker is really tough to sink. It really is. Uh, first off, it doesn't explode like it does in the movies all the time. You see that that, that tends not to happen. Uh, it's loaded with oil on board, uh, whether it's crude oil or refined product. Uh, but even if it's refined product, there's inert gas that's pumped into the holes so that you can't get an explosive limit on it. Uh, the other weird thing that people don't ever think about with tankers is if you punch a hole in the side of a tanker, it doesn't sink. It actually raises up out of the water because it's full of liquid. So it actually becomes more buoyant. Most people don't think about that. Uh, 
And these drones do not have huge explosives on board, but they can kill crew, they can damage a vessel, and I'm not saying they can't sink anything because all it takes is a pinhole to sink a vessel. Uh, they can cause damage. What's interesting is the strike on this vessel that I haven't heard anybody really talk about it. So this is the vessel right here, the Pacific Zircon. And the Pacific Zircon is, is not a vessel that for any reason that I can identify would be one that you would want to target. It's out of Oman. It's heading to Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's Liberian flagged. When you pull it up through its registry system here at ABS, uh, it's it's owned in uh, it's its classification society is the American Bureau of Shipping. It's owned in Singapore uh, by the uh, uh, Friend Shine Shipping. Uh, company out of Singapore. So I, I'm not exactly sure what the purpose of the strike is beyond to inflict damage on it. And it really raises the question, okay, what's the response from the world's navies? Go back to Bruce Jones and the rule of the, the oceans. One of the things that the world's navies have done, not just the U.S. Navy, because it's been a element of all the world's navies, is ensure that the world's oceans have been free and open to navigate. That's true against threats from major nation states like Soviet Union, China. But the problem here is nations like Iran that do these style of attacks. Because if you go back to the 1980s and the tanker wars, nations didn't do crap about that. I mean, they didn't, they didn't intervene in the tanker war until the very end. And the only reason they intervened in the end was when the Kuwaitis convinced the United States to reflag tankers under the American registry, and then they were American tankers. And then the United States got involved in escorting tankers. But prior to that, prior to 1987, that, I, mean, I mean, it was the wild, wild west in the, in, in the Persian Gulf. Even piracy off the east coast of Somalia, yeah, you know, we all go save Tom Hanks uh, on board Maersk, Alabama as Captain Phillips. But for many of the crews who are on Liberian, Panamanian, Marshall Island, these open registry vessels, nobody came to help them. They sat there for sometimes up to a year being held prisoner until the ship's companies paid them off. And now what we see is the use, and everyone's saying this now on Twitter, because again, once something happens on Twitter, everyone's an expert on Twitter. It's like, well, we need to arm these vessels. Well, there are private security firms that do this. I mean, there's there's a big business in this where private security come on board. You have issues with these security personnel can't come into certain countries. The weapons have to be locked up or removed off the vessels. There's a lot associated with it. But you also have to find now a weapon to use against drones because, you know, scaring off a boat full of Somalis is one thing. But when a drone comes crashing into you, that's a bit of a different threat level you have, and it involves different weapons and board. And now a lot of people are sitting there saying, well, the Navy needs to come in and escort it, and there's not enough Navy vessels in the world to escort all the ships in and out of the Persian Gulf and that area. There's not enough security detachments, Marines, to put on every vessel. That's not going to happen. So what needs to happen is the Iranians need to stop doing this. And, and hopefully one of the things that we start seeing is Navy start being a little proactive here and start shooting these things down and interdicting them out of the air before they have the opportunity to strike. Because if the Iranians are going to make a process of hitting neutral vessels that have no say in what's going on, then that means that Iran has become basically a lawless state and shouldn't be allowed to operate in international waters. And that's my opinion. That's that's my opinion. It differs from a lot of other people's opinions. But if you're just wantingly hitting commercial ships for no reason whatsoever, then you're a menace to navigation at that point. And that means that if your navies are truly out there to protect the freedom of the seas, that's what they should be doing. If not, then we need to have a discussion about what navies are for, because then we need to start hiring private contractors, privateer the crap out of this thing. And let's start fighting back against these attacks. It, it, it's not an easy subject. And let me be clear, this has been going on for a long time. Whether it's these drones flying overhead, whether it's piracy off the west coast of Africa, off the coast of Singapore, off the east coast of uh, Somalia in the early 2000s, the tanker war of the 1980s. This has been an issue that's been around for a long, long time. And it will be around for a long time. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number four. All right, we talked about drone strike. Let's talk about tugboat strike. Schweitzer ordered to scrap harbor tug worker lockout in Australia. Man, this is a polarizing issue. I can't tell you how much this one is. I got involved in reading about this over the past week following it, and I've read both sides of this. And man, this, this is this is a oh, this is this is a mess 
in Australia. So the issue here was Schweitzer, which is owned by Maersk. Uh, this is a tugboat company in Australia. They operate the harbor tugs that bring vessels in and out of most of the major ports. Think about 17 major ports in Australia. Schweitzer, owned by Maersk, was going to lock out its employees. They were going to basically say, okay, we've been negotiating for four years. We haven't gotten anywhere. And so we're going to lock you out. Basically, we're, we're stop paying you. We're just going to stop working. And so it wasn't that the union was going on strike. It was the company was going on strike against the union. And so they announced this. Now, the Australia's Fair Work Commission basically said, okay, you can't do that. We're, we're not going to allow this to happen. And so they interdicted this. And so it doesn't happen. Now, they were negotiating with three unions, the Maritime Union of Australia, the Australian Institute of Marine and Power Engineers, and the Australian Maritime Officers Union. And they said that these control 75% of the Australian trade coming in, according to the ITF, in 17 ports. And again, this story has been out there for a while now, brewing on the horizon. And what's interesting about it and what I read, and again, I don't know the ins and, ins and outs the, enough, but I've been talking to someone, I'm trying to get her on to talk about this because she knows this better than I do, is number one, the two sides are vehemently opposed to each other. So on one side, the union sees the fact that they haven't gotten raises in four years and they want to get a share of the profits from Maris. This is not unusual. This is exactly what's happening with the ILWU on the West Coast of the United States right now. Labor is in the driving seat. Companies have, are awash in profits, and the workers want part of that. Sounds fair. On the flip side, I've read stories about the unions in Australia and the fact that union workers are the most highly paid on these tugs. They don't work hours. I mean, you name it. I've read everything that you can imagine derogatory toward a union that's out there. You know, hey, you know, there's a problem with the boat and it's it's a Saturday, so the crew can't fix it because it's it, it's not in their contracts. And so I, I, I've read this stuff so much about unions, I can't even tell you. So... Obviously, it's 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 finger pointing at this point. And what they need is an arbitrator to come in and really sit down and come up with this, because if not, this has the potential to be catastrophic for Australia, because if it's not Schweitzer locking out the, the tugboat crews, it could be the unions striking on them. And obviously, this is an issue we saw. What we saw happen with P&O ferries over in England with something similar with this is P&O sat there and said, fine, you're all fired. They came in one morning, watched a video like this, and someone got on and said, you're redundant and fired everybody. And then they brought in Indian crews and paid them the minimum wage they could pay them to operate. And it created a catastrophe in England over the P&O ferries. This is an issue that's looming on the horizon. And remember, Australia has done a lot to get rid of its merchant marine. It has almost no merchant marine left. Uh, these tugboats and coastal boats are about all that's left that use Australian crews anymore. And Australia is having this conversation now about a national fleet about recreating a national flagged fleet and what it takes to do that. Now, a lot of people oppose this because it costs taxpayers money. It, 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 needs, it needs something from the government for it to get kicked off because you're not in a level playing field when you go against shipbuilders in China, Japan, and Korea or registries like Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands. Again, when you pay a crew member $21 a day, you know you get away with a lot. And this is the issue we're seeing with Schweitzer right now. So a big story out of Australia. All right, let's go to our last story. All right, last story is a sensitive story for a couple of reasons, because we're dealing with the issue of sexual assault and sexual harassment in the maritime sector, and in particularly uh, with the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. This is the federal academy that trains merchant mariners. Created back in World War II, it is one of five uh, maritime federal academies, and it's the only one that's geared to a specific occupation, the merchant marine. All the others are military in order. And so this story that came out, Maersk Lines Limited settles sexual assault and harassment lawsuit with Midshipman X. Midshipman X is Midshipman Hope Hicks, who came out and had filed this 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 really powerful story uh, about the Midshipman X scandal, uh, where she was uh, uh, talking about being sexually harassed 
on board a Maersk Line vessel during her summer sea terms uh, or their, the, the, the sea year that they do. So uh, students at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy have to do their sea time on commercial vessels. And so she was on a commercial vessel. She reported being sexually assaulted by one of her bosses. I can't remember if it was the chief engineer or first assistant engineer on board. And, and this is a horrific thing on board a vessel because she was the only woman on board. Uh, she could not really protect herself. And the, she was all alone, basically. And that is a scary, scary event. And this came out and created a huge wave. Now, understand, this is not new. I mean, back in 2016, there were cases, there was alleged, uh, allegations about this. And they suspended the uh, sea tour for merchant um, uh, cadets at the time. And then they restarted it for the midshipmen. And so all of this has been going on here. And I know that in particularly Ann Phillips, a new maritime administrator, uh, Lucinda, Lucinda Leslie, who is the uh, associate maritime administrator, she had been acting for quite a while. This is a priority issue for them. This is an issue that they're looking to deal with, and it needs to be deal, dealt with. Let me be clear about something. I'm going to be 100% clear about this. And I've said this numerous times, and I will keep saying it. If I'm a merchant mariner and I spill oil in the water, I spill 10 gallons of oil in the water, I have to report that. I have to report that to the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard is coming on my vessel. The EPA is coming on my vessel. There's going to be an investigation on this. I may lose my license if there's any potential of a problem here that I did not do what I was supposed to do. Yet sexual assault, sexual harassment has never been treated that way. Has never been treated that way. The number of cases that have been alleged and investigated are minuscule over the past 10 years. And that's a problem. That is the fundamental problem. And anyone who wants to challenge me on that, let's go. I am ready to challenge you. Have maritime administration, have the Coast Guard release their documents on how many sexual assault, how many sexual harassment cases they have investigated over the past decade. And then we'll talk about this. This is the problem because it has been so quiet that no one is afraid to say anything. Everyone's afraid to say anything. It's, it's like they're back in the 50s and 60s in this industry in some cases. And I think that's one of the reasons why you saw this happen next. The U.S. Merchant Marine appointed Joanne Noonan as first female superintendent. Uh, Admiral Noonan is a Coast Guard admiral, two-star uh, rear admiral, who retired was uh, in the running to replace Jack Buono, who was, Jack was uh, the previous commander, or superintendent, excuse me, of the Merchant Marine Academy. Extensive experience in the commercial industry, extensive experience in shipping. Uh, absolutely fantastic. We got promoted from rear admiral to vice admiral in the U.S. Maritime Service, whatever the hell that means, because it doesn't really exist. Uh, but th that's what he was. But he announced his resignation. I said that he was leaving because of sexual assault, sexual harassment. I had people push back on me on that. I still stand by what I said. I think he left because of this. I'm, I'm pretty clear about that. I am comfortable to say that. I have heard, had, because I heard it from enough sources that I'm comfortable saying that. But I think bringing in Joanna Noonan in as superintendent is meant to do a couple of things. She, did at the U.S. Coast Guard personnel, that's a key issue right there. So she understands issues like sexual assault, sexual harassment. Is this going to make the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy uh, alumni happy? No, it's not. It's not. I, but then again, nothing makes them happy. I'm going to tell you that right now. Nothing's going to make them happy. Jack Wano made them happy, and, and they had him for quite a few years there, so they should be happy about that. But if you look at superintendents in the past, man, it's, it's, it's sometimes been a revolving door at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And I think what they need is some direction. They need some direction right now. And I'm hoping that Admiral Noonan brings that in there because they need more than just deal with sexual assault, sexual harassment. The U.S. Merchant Marine Academy should be the leader in talking about the maritime industry and what it does for the United States. Remember, the mission of the Maritime Administration, which oversees the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, is to promote and support the U.S. Merchant Marine and the maritime industry. And every graduate from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, along with the five state academies, should be advocates for this industry. This should be a powerful, powerful entity. Every year when the graduates walk across the stage from those six schools, they should be talking about what is the maritime industry. And with everything that just went on with the supply chain, you would think that would be front and center. But 
not always. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that, Sal? One of two ways. One, you can hit that super thanks button down below, allows you to contribute directly to the page, or head on over to Patreon, become a patron of the page. You can support the page monthly, yearly, at any level you want. Any support is appreciated. Until our next episode, this is Sal, signing off. <laughs>